Welcome to Brookings. I'm John Allen. I'm the president of the institution. Uh, you are most welcome today, and for those coming in by webcast, uh, we welcome you as well. Now, today we're going to be discussing something concerning many of us at this moment in history. It's the growing tide of <coughs> illiberal, illiberalism as it seems to be threatening increasingly democratic institutions and governments on both sides of the Atlantic. I think it's fair to say that we've learned that democracy is not inevitable, and it needs to be understood, it needs to be nurtured, it needs to be cared for, and it needs to be guarded with great vigilance. Now, this rising tide of illiberalism, <clears throat> some will wring their hands, some will gnash their teeth, but some, some will, in fact, be focused on solutions, and that's what we're about this morning. Today, we have two of our esteemed Brookings scholars here, authors and senior fellows who have written on this subject, Bob Kagan and Norm Eisen, both of whom will discuss their new books, which basically detail democracy's role in battling and defeating illiberalism. Bob Kagan is a senior fellow here at Brookings in the Foreign Policy uh, Research Program. He's also a contributing columnist to the Washington Post, and his latest book, The Jungle Grows Back, America and Our Imperiled World, considers the democratizing effect of America's presence around the world and advocates for its reassertion in an increasingly isolationist age. Also with us today is another of our senior fellows, Ambassador Norm Eisen who is out of our governance studies here at Brookings, and from 2009 to 2011, he served as President Obama's ethics advisor, ethics czar, and as the US advisor to the Czech Republic in Prague from 2011 to 2014. And his book, his new book, The Last Palace, Europe's Turbulent Century in Five Lives and One Legendary House, tells the story of, of an ongoing century-long struggle between liberalism and autocracy through the lives of those who preceded him in the ambassadorial residence in Prague, a really unique story. And we're truly delighted this morning to welcome NPR's Steve Inskeep, who will be moderating this panel. Steve hosts NPR's Morning Edition and the podcast Up First He's received multiple awards for his journalistic excellence, including the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award, and we're very happy to have you with us this morning, Steve. And after this panel, please remain, because Norm will join descendants of the four protagonists of his book, specifically four former inhabitants of the Prague ambassadorial residence, which he discusses in his book. And together, for the first time, they're going to be on a panel to discuss the human dimension of history. And moderating that panel and that discussion will be Linda Wertheimer, a senior national correspondent at NPR. And Linda, it's wonderful to have you with us this morning. Brookings is really honored to have our friends from NPR and to welcome the network to us, uh, with us this morning. And let me remind everyone here that we're on the record and we'll be going out live uh, on our webcast. So now for our first panel, let me welcome to the stage Bob Kagan, Norm Eisen, and Steve Inskeep. Thank you very much. This one? Testing one, two. Hi, good morning. Welcome to everybody here. It's an honor uh, to be talking with uh, both of these authors. And General Allen, thank you very much for the, uh, for the introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, I was delighted with this book, The Last Palace, from one of the early pages in which Ambassador Eisen quotes his mother. Uh, he's telling his mother that he's going to be the ambassador to Prague, the United States ambassador to Prague. And one of the things she says is, what do you know about diplomacy? <laughs> so I appreciate that. This is a very human story, which we're going to get to. But I want to begin with Robert Kagan. Uh, 
who gives us something of an intellectual framework, I think, for the topic of today's, to, today's conference, today's discussions. The Jungle Grows Back, America and Our Imperiled World, argues, well, it's not precisely that we're the indispensable nation, but what are you saying in, about the United States' role in the world when it comes to democracy and liberalism around the world? Uh, well, thank, thank you, Steve, for doing this, and it's great to be on the panel here with Norm, who I'm a huge fan of, and the book is wonderful, as I hope you all know already, but you should, you should uh, discover it soon. Uh, I think we tend, especially these days, to take for granted a certain kind of international system that has, if you look at the great sweep of history, uh, it has, it, it's one of the rarest moments in that long history, combining not only a general peace among the great powers, economic prosperity, but also, as you say, an incredible spread of democracy. And I think either we take it for granted or we assume that it's just in the nature of things to move in this direction of progress. We have a very enlightenment view of history, a teleological view. Um, but I think history suggests, and as we're sort of witnessing right now, uh, that's not the way it works. And I, I think it's, it's very hard to separate uh, causality here, when you look at when this period began, 1945, uh, and what was the nature of the international system that made this whole uh, great success story uh, possible. And it really was uh, the role of the United States uh, after World War II uh, in establishing an international system based on democratic alliances, an open economic order, uh, and certain uh, basic rules of the road which were more or less followed, not always even by the United States, but nevertheless made possible this security order within which this liberal democratic uh, world could take place. And I, I, don't, I want to hasten and say it was not because the United States was always systematically and consistently supporting democracy, but it did make this, uh, this space available in which democracy could flourish. Would you define would you define the elements of that space? What is it that the United States did that made it possible for there to be greater freedom in the world? Well, I would say the most important thing the United States did was take two regions of the world that had been caught in an endless cycle of conflict uh, and put an end to the conflicts in those uh, regions. I'm talking about Europe and Asia. And specifically, uh, dealing with Germany in such a way that this uh, autocratic, aggressive nation which had caused so much uh, agony in the world through its uh, treatment of its neighbors uh, became a peaceful, democratic, economic success story in no small part due to the fact that the United States provided security in Europe and provided reassurance to both sides in that ancient conflict. And the same thing with Japan. And with Germany and Japan anchoring the democratic, peaceful, an economically successful world. In a way, that made everything else possible. And as long as they are those things, uh, we'll still sustain this kind of international system. Why do you think it's, forgive me, why do you think it's necessary to be saying this now? Because I think, uh, un unfortunately, that order uh, is at risk uh, of falling apart. And, and we think about, of course, China and Russia and Iran, and we're right to do so. Uh, but in my mind, uh, the real threat is the collapse of the more fundamental foundations of that order. So if the United States were to pull out and away from both Europe and Asia, uh, I don't think we can be as sanguine as perhaps we once were that Europe and Asia couldn't return to the past. And that's sort of what I mean by the jungle growing back. You know, what The way the world looked in 1939, uh, it isn't over. It, we could return to a world that looks more like that. Before we uh, bring Ambassador Eisen into the conversation, I want to ask if the order, the world order is really in that much danger. We could make a case that President Trump has pushed against the European allies, has spoken negatively about allies, but hasn't really changed that much in the NATO alliance, uh, and has pushed for them to contribute more to their own defense, which is something that the Obama administration did. We could make a case that in China and in Asia more generally, despite uh, trade war and other things, the basic security structure has remained the same. Uh, are you sure that this is really a moment of peril? Yeah. You know, if, if, if history works in a funny way, if you've been looking around the world 
Oh, yeah, thank you. History works in a funny way. If you've been looking around the world in 1925, you would have said all those same things. Uh, and 10 years later, it had, it had all fallen apart. Um, so one of the things we don't remember is how quickly things fall apart. There's a great line in the Hemingway novel. They asked somebody how he went bankrupt. The, his answer was gradually and then suddenly. Um, and that's the way I feel the world order, that's the way of world orders. So here, here are the elements that I find concerning, uh, even though everything you say is true. And by the way, my argument is not about Donald Trump. This has been going on for a while. These trends have been visible for, for a while, including the trend in the United States. I thought everything was about Donald Trump. <laughs> I thought that was the new reality. No, go on, please. Uh, please. Including the fact that the American people, I think, for, for some decades, have been less and less interested in playing this sort of historic role because of the burdens uh, that it entails. But if you look at just, let's just take Europe for a second, which is a place we've taken completely for granted. Don't worry, everything's going to be fine. At least Europe is secure. Um, we see a return to nationalism. We see a return uh, of, of autocracy in, in parts of Europe where there had been a growth of democracy. You see the return of suspicions, which never really left among European powers. If you remember that what pulled Europe together and made the sort of general, provided the basic foundation which made the EU and the European Commission possible, at the end of the day, it was this American security guarantee. So if all the things that I'm talking about are happening in Europe, and then we add to that an increasing distance between the United States and Europe, that to me is the final uh, sort of pulling out, the final uh, prop that has kept everything up. So if I flip open your book, there's a, a paragraph to which you've already sort of alluded. Among the worst horrors of recorded history occurred in the lifetimes of our grandparents. Just 75 years ago, Hitler was rampaging across <laughs> Europe, which allows us to make a transition into the last palace, which is a story of essentially the 20th century as seen through a building. It's a little architecture history. Is that, uh, is that a correct description? Um, why don't you describe, Ambassador, for those who have not had a chance to dip into this book, what is the building? What is the last palace? Uh, thank you, Steve, and um, uh, to stimulate the same vexation as my overly long answers do when I come on your program Speed live. Speed it up, quickly, come on. <laughs> he, he does this to yeah. me. I'm not very well suited to the rigors of uh, live radio. Um, uh, if you'll permit me just to say a word before I answer your question, um, I w this is an ambassadorial failing. I, I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank my, my Brookings brother, Bob Kagan, both for joining me for this, but also for welcoming me when I came to Brookings so warmly into uh, our foreign policy uh, uh, family here. I must thank our current president, John Allen, and our past president, Strobe Talbot, uh, for their support of me and the book. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm deeply grateful to that. Daryl West, who's the head of our governance studies program. Um, all of the protagonists, uh, descendants, who are here for our second panel, thank you for coming from far and wide. Bill Galston, who will comment as we exit this panel, which will be roughly coextensive with the end of the answer to Steve's question, <laughs> I think. Uh, and um, as we say uh, in Hebrew, uh, acharon, acharon, habibi, uh, the best for last. I must thank my, my best friend, Dan Berger, who's here, who I spoke to every day in my Brookings life on all of my work, supports all the work, leads uh, leads the, the, the thinking, the advising on our progress in open society work, uh, and um, uh, uh, helped me in every way possible with, uh, with this book. One of the things, one of the okay, things that I, I'm no, no, well, I was going to say, one of the things I have to do on the radio when people do not answer the question is repeat the question. What's the building? Uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> the, building the building is the Petchek Villa. Uh, which is uh, regarded uh, as the most beautiful uh, in, uh, in Prague, which is saying something in that one of the most beautiful, which is saying something in that ravishing uh, city. Uh, when I was in the White House and getting ready to move as ambassador to Prague, I discovered that this was the most lusted after uh, real estate uh, in the diplomatic corps. And indeed, it's magnificent. It was designed by my friend Mark Robinson's great-grandfather, 
uh, Otto Petschek uh, as a tribute to the Wilsonian moment, one of my very light divergences of emphasis uh, with Bob uh, is uh, on the, the importance of 1918, although he talks about it a lot in his book. Um, uh, Otto Petschek designed it as a combination of everything that was best in uh, uh, this moment of hope when a small United States was created, Czechoslovakia, assembled out of Austro-Hungary, and in, indeed as a tribute to Wilson's work at Versailles. And Trianon, it has elements uh, of those uh, two things, as well as a lot of that's modern in it, Steve. Uh, I found a set of Frank Lloyd Wright, the first published set of Frank Lloyd Wright blueprints, published in Germany when nobody knew who he was, heavily marked and annotated by the brilliant Otto Petschek, who designed and constructed this house. He's, he's, like a, he's a businessman, right? He, he figured out a, how to make money off World War I. He is one of those protean, he did, He's one of those protean Jewish geniuses, less well known than his law school classmate Kafka, uh, Einstein, Freud, but of that generation, the explosion of talent so long repressed uh, in, in the ghetto and expressing itself in the uh, 19th century, uh, post the 19th century uh, liberal, liberalization of restrictions on Jewish participation in society. So he builds this wonderful building as a, a symbol, he intends it as a symbol of liberalism, and then immediately the building serves that function because he starts encountering all the struggles of liberalism that Bob uh, writes about so eloquently in his book, and that my characters over the 100 years from 1918, the end of World War I, to today, um, uh, uh, that the people I write about uh, continue to struggle with, and he deals with it in the construction of the building. It's a symbol of the problems of constructing liberalism. Uh, the jungle literally grows back in his backyard as he's uh, tearing down and rebuilding. And uh, to skip ahead just a little bit, uh, the family is I there. promise this will be a shorter okay. answer it's and okay. on topic. It's okay. It's okay. This is all on topic. It's all really useful, and it's fascinating and rich and detailed, which I appreciate, by the way, because you realize that history is a story of people and a story of a million small decisions, and the general summary of things often can leave out, leave out a lot. But in this case, we have a country that comes out of the idea of national self-determination, sounds like such a good idea, but it turns out not to be that defensible a country, gets dismembered by Hitler, and what happened to the Petschek family? Well, the, uh, the Petschek family uh, can, now, uh, can now be found in, their, in their, the Petschek family, uh, its descendants in all of their various names uh, can now be found uh, uh, scattered across the United States and the world, uh, not unlike uh, my own uh, family and so many other European uh, Jewish families. Um, the, they flee. I, do, I won't do a spoiler alert on Otto's struggles, or I guess I, uh, I, I won't reveal Otto's, uh, uh, ult the ultimate end of his struggles, in some ways successful as a symbol of li liberalism, but also exemplifying its challenges. But he left the, the house, for sure. The house was left behind. The Petscheks fled in 1938 en masse uh, uh, in a train to the Eucharistic Congress in Budapest. I had the pleasure of getting to be friends with the original uh, last living original occupant of the house, Eva Petschek Goldman, who passed in her 90s several years ago, and she visited me in the house. Uh, and uh, I asked Eva, is it true that the entire family chartered a rail car and uh, in the midst of a scare, the May crisis uh, of 1938, when they thought that the German invasion that ultimately came in 39 was going to come, that you all left for a Eucharistic Congress, for a Catholic Congress. I thought you were Jewish. And she looked at me like, you know, she gave me that look that my mom often gave me, like, you dummy. And she said, silly boy, that was the only visa we could get. So they did all flee. They got out intact. One of the chilling moments for me in researching this book, Steve, was when I, in, I was in the Hoover archives. I often uh, 
went to Northern California to visit my other adopted book cousins, the children uh, family of uh, Shirley Temple Black, and I was in the Hoover uh, archives, and I found a little book that the Nazis had printed up uh, for the invasion to give to their officers for the invasion of the British islands. And uh, in that book were listed all of the Petcheks who had fled as targets to be apprehended. Um, so, um, but they got out. They mostly ended up in America, some in uh, in Latin America, and uh, fortunately, they, for the sake of my book, they took their papers with them. And the house was conveniently left vacant as Germans ultimately took over. Uh, yes, it was not entirely vacant. One of the wonderful characters I discovered was uh, Adolf Picorni, the caretaker, the keeper, the, the major domo who preserved this house through Czechoslovak Jewish uh, Nazi German, um, Soviet, and then American uh, ownership and control. And uh, Pan Pokorny stayed in the house. We found his, his surviving uh, relatives who remembered and visited and had pictures and notes and things. He stayed in the house, and he protected the house, including the Jewish identity of the house. The Jewish artifacts were left in place, amazingly. Throughout the Nazi period. Amazingly. When Ava visited me, she saw in the library we had the great um, uh, uh, um, a German, Jew, German language Jewish encyclopedia, 13 magnificent scholarly volumes, one of the uh, a great ach achievements of Weimar scholarship. And she said, that is the same encyclopedia that we used when I was growing up. Hmm. Only 13 volumes. It only goes through the middle of the alphabet because when Hitler became chancellor, the uh, publication was suspended uh, with volume 13. Wow. wow, that is amazing. There are high points, there are low points in the story of this house. What happened there? And uh, the high point, obviously, is when Norm Eisen was the Hardly, um, hardly. But what happened in 1989? Well, um, the, um, the, the house is, is, is kind of like an ocean liner that travels through the, the century. And it's not really, I found myself when I, uh, when I had the privilege of reading first the essay that gave rise to Bob's book and then Bob's book, reflecting that all the same events that he writes about were, can be viewed through the portholes of that ocean liner, through the windows of that house in the eyes of the people there. In 1989, the occupant of the house was uh, one of our most famous citizen diplomats, um, uh, Shirley Temple Black, uh, who had been in Prague in that house the day, this was so convenient for me as an off author when I discovered this upstairs in my, my little Brookings writing cubby, uh, uh, she had been in the house the day the Soviets invaded in 1968, and she completed the work. She ch decided then she would come back to Prague someday as, as United States ambassador and help end this terrible communist regime, completing the work of uh, Ambassador Lawrence Steinhardt, who fought the advent of the Cold War. And uh, in his day, another incredible thing, Steve, he was as famous a citizen diplomat as Shirley Temple Black was. Mm. He was on the front pages of newspapers regularly, a forgotten American hero who I've been pleased to reclaim. And Shirley Temple Black completed that American mission that started with this house being rescued by Ambassador Steinhardt. She did help end the Cold War from the premises of that house and using that house. Wow. Um, so we have the story of this house. We have the story of this country. Uh, if I could summarize tons of history in a couple of sentences, <laughs> created by the idea of national self-determination, undermined by the idea of national self-determination, right? Because there were Germans, ethnic Germans, within the borders, and Hitler was able to take advantage of that and pry the country apart. Fell under communist rule. Communist rule fell. Uh, had a very famous poet uh, <laughs> uh, as president. I mean, a very different, very different uh, era. What's happening now? Let me ask you both. What's happening now in that region of the world? Robert Kaplan? 
Kagan, excuse me, what am I saying? There's, Kagan. There's Kaplan. If Kagan. Robert were, if Robert were here, we'll he would, do, Mr. He would Kagan. say pretty so much sorry. the same thing Please. I'm about to say. Please, go right ahead. I, it, it, it's, uh, it's so hard to keep Kagan and Kaplan. Uh, I don't, um, it's to your benefit, really. No, I know. He sells more books than I do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Plus, I'm married to a Plus, I'm married to a Kaplan, so now okay, we're related. We Can I have a loan? I'm sorry. <laughs> Whoa. You know, I, uh, Steve, when I was listening to you tell that story, it began with an idea and, and, and then this idea, and I, I, all of which has, has, has a certain truth to it. But, it, you know, it's amazing how we tend to leave out the geopolitics in these stories. And the interesting thing about uh, Czechoslovakia and the Czech Republic is that Czechoslovakia and the Czech Republic are both beneficiaries and victims of strategic decisions. I have to say that the ideas are secondary, ultimately. And I, that's the last thing that any enlightenment person like us wants to hear. But Czechoslovakia existed in the first place, not so much because of self the idea of self-determination, but because France wanted to build a bulwark in the East against the rise of another German threat. Oh, and that was an idea that could support their strategic aim, in right. other words. But, yeah. uh, but you know, Wilson, for a long period during the war, was ambivalent about even the breakup of Austria-Hungary because he wanted to try to enlist Austria-Hungary and pull them away from Germany during the war, etc. So the French set up, uh, were the driving force behind setting up, setting up at Czechoslovakia so that it would be a bulwark in the East because Russia had fallen away. That was the old bulwark in the East. And in a way, the whole drama of the interwar period is what happens to Czechoslovakia. Uh, because, uh, you know, the question was, would they, if it was going to be a bulwark, it had to be defended. And the big moment came at Munich when the decision was made whether to defend it or not. And lying behind all of this was the United States either was it going to act or was it not going to act? And it's worth remembering that the Versailles Agreement was never intended to take place without the United States. And when the United States pulled out of Europe, all these balancing efforts fell apart. So then you get to World War II and uh, the critical decision, which Norm and I were talking about before, of the American forces at Eisenhower's decision not to continue going eastward during the war, but to, but to stop and, and divide the continent up into two. Uh, and then, of course, the Czechoslovakia and ultimately Czech Republic are freed because of a fundamentally geostrategic shift. Um, and this is sort of, you know, I have to punctuate his fascinating stories about Shirley Temple Black with my boring stories about <laughs> geopolitics and geostrategy. <laughs> so you, I'll, I'll stop in any second now. But, you know, I, I do think we, t we lose sight, I think, and underplay the importance of underlying power relationships in the fostering and strengthening of the ideas that we value. And if those ideas don't have power behind them, they don't just win because they're better ideas. I think that's what we're learning. Ambassador? Well, uh, uh, the, um, the, on, on the, uh, the two, uh, you know, Czechoslovakia has two daddies, uh, and uh, one, one is French and the other is American. And there is a fascinating transformation that Wilson undergoes in the course of the war, uh, uh, the, uh, in which he's lobbied by the Czechs and specifically by uh, his friend Crane, who would later become the ambassador, and by Masaryk. And there is a professorial bond. Um, uh, uh, and so you have, in that moment of 1918, you have, I think, the begin Hobsbawm writes about the short with some false optimism for all of the horrors he witnessed. He writes about the short 20th century. If anything, I'm arguing for a long 20th century uh, that begin begins in 1918 and that is still ticking forward. And you get, a, it, it, you get a transatlantic moment when Wilson, for all his flaws, brings a genuine idealism to somewhat to the realpolitik of the French. Um, uh, Benish is uh, amazed, is surprised, at, at Ma Benish is furiously uh, working the French, and Masaryk is floating off uh, in America, uh, and suddenly you get uh, the Washington Declaration, which, uh, as it's known, which established, and the Pittsburgh Declaration, the two founding declarations that established this new country. I came as a surprise to Otto Petschek, who, uh, uh, you're correct, made a big bet on the, and, and potentially dangerous bet 
on the success of the West in World War I, but didn't count on a Slovak. He didn't invest in any Slovak properties because everyone was surprised at the agglomeration of the Czech lands and the Slovak lands together. But in that moment, and Bob writes very eloquently about this in the book, um, in that moment, the, I, the, there's a birth moment, uh, could be, you could say, 1917. Another place where I agree with Bob is on the fundamental illiberalism. We're somewhat revisionist in our views. The fundamental illiberalism of the G German regime, there's been a big historical push. We could debate it forever about uh, whether all sides were equally to blame for World War I. I do think that this that the uh, transcendent notion of uh, liberal, transatlantic liberal democracy was struggling uh, to, anyhow, we agree on that, otherwise uh, we have a not, we, there's many other things we disagree on. It's very entertaining at our periodic lunches, but we strongly agree on the illiberal nature of the Kaiser's regime and alliance. Of course, the czar was in our alliance, Bob, so we weren't perfect. I'm a little disposed to czars, however, since I was one. Not only you. Um, my mother loved to say, it's in the book she loved to say, uh, when they would call me the ethics czar, as John kindly mentioned, she loved to say, it is the only time a czar has ever been good for the Jews. <laughs> um, um. So you have this birth moment. I'm almost done. You have this birth moment in 19... I can't do this when we're on the air. That's the only reason I invited Steve. Uh, we you have this birth the, moment the, the in 1918. The radio program has already gone to the weather forecast. Go on. <laughs> You have a birth moment of this new idea in which the realpolitik, Bob describes, is cross-pollinated with American revolutionary ideas uh, that are somewhat foreign uh, to uh, the European way of doing politics. And the struggle ever since, in this long 20th century that I uh, write about, the struggle ever since comes from uh, the uneasiness of these two aspects of uh, transatlantic democracy and liberalism in cohabiting. By the way, it's an uneasiness that the American experiment has wrestled with since the very beginning as well, because we have our own discomforts with the full expanse of the liberal idea. So we're talking about liberalism or illiberalism, as the hashtag would suggest, and talking also about power structures. Let me try to connect those if I can. First, if we're talking about liberal values and not liberal in the way it's used in American politics, but in a more global sense, um, what's a really short list of the values we're talking about? Free speech, what else? Well, the primary element of, of liberalism is that the rights of the individual are, are supersede the rights of the state. I mean, if you think about what World War I was about, we've completely forgotten it because we don't, we're not taught this anymore for some reason. Uh, Germany really stood for the primacy of the state, uh, the primacy of the nation, and the, and, the, and the individuals were supposed to serve that nation. That was their best calling. Um, liberalism is about, is what Locke talks about, government and what the founders talk about. Government is founded to serve the people, uh, not the other way around. And so that means that the government's uh, uh, powers are limited, that individual rights are respected, free speech is, is one of those, the ability to choose and change a government uh, by, uh, by a vote um, is, a, is a critical element of that. That's what liberalism means. And it, by the way, it's very young. It's, a, it's about, it's two centuries, two and a half centuries old. The rest of human history, with some very brief windows of exception, has not been about liberalism. So that leads to my next question. You've suggested that support for these liberal values may grow out of the power structure, power relations, rather cynical uh, decisions or self-interested decisions among nations. Um, <laughs> Is the global power structure endangering liberalism today, and if so, in what way? Well, I, I'll I ask mean, you both. I think I'm sorry, I'll, I'll, uh, Norm. Uh, you first, Bob. Uh, you know, it's interesting. We talk about let's talk about let's go back to 1918. As a result of World War One and the victory of the liberal forces in World War One, there was a spread of democracy in Europe. Uh, there were a number of nations, Lithuania, Poland, uh, etc., who began democratic experiments. Um, then the United States withdraws. The sort of Western liberal powers are in disarray. 
And those liberal experiments, those democratic experiments, uh, go away by themselves. No one, there's no war, there's no overthrow, the, just the, the idea fades. And that gives us, I think, a, a sense of how much the overall power relationship in the international system affects the decisions and actions of peoples, even in smaller countries that are not involved. So the fact that it isn't just cynicism, the fact that since 1945, the strongest power in the world has been the sort of original enlightenment power, been the original liberal power, uh, has meant that liberalism has had power behind it. And so what we're seeing today, I believe, is not only the normal challenges that liberalism is inevitably going to face from basic factors of human existence <laughs> and human nature, but also a retraction of American uh, involvement and influence by choice in our case rather than by necessity, which has been occurring pretty much uh, sort of steadily ever since the end of the Cold War. Uh, part, part of the issue with the youth of liberalism, again, the, where we diverge, there are divergences of emphasis. Uh, I, I agree with the primacy of the American experiment, but I think the British, you point to Locke, I think the British varieties of liberalism and the French, uh, more radical varieties, ours is a bounded and checked liberalism that fears the, the, the full power of liberty, fraternity, and uh, equality, and so we bound it. Um, uh, you know, I think the British and French variants are important, and they loom large here. Uh, part of the reason that I wrote the book, and that I wrote the book the way I did, and this is to Bob's point about the newness of the liberal idea, um, I, I have a belief that um, uh, stories are critical to um, moving people, and part of the part of what we struggle with in liberalism is the the narratives of liberalism are newer. They don't have the unlike biblical narratives, say, which are three thousand or more years old. They're newer narratives. We need stories, and uh, and so uh, you know that's going to be a process. That's also part of anchoring liberalism. Um, I, I also think that the, the role of, uh, the, the, ultimately the role of America is critical in this long 20th century that I write about when America really comes on the international scene in a different way with Wilson's aspiration and as Bob so eloquently describes with a different set of imperial ambitions, a totally uh, uh, foreign uh, 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 idea of, of wanting what we want to project on the world is our values and actually welcoming a Germany and a Japan to do as well or better uh, as we do in that kind of empire uh, of ideas. Uh, I, one moment comes to mind on this. So the pattern that I describe is one of uh, American advent, liberal flourishing in 1918, 1945, 1989, and then of illiberal, autocratic, anti-democratic counter-reaction, uh, uh, either uh, uh, immediately or as in the interwar period, gradually, caused always by American withdrawal. Uh, the absence uh, uh, of uh, the vacuum that is created by America stepping back from this model, this transatlantic model it's created, um, and then inevitably, pulling America back in because we are so firmly anchored in this transatlantic um, uh, alliance. Uh, so we get, and the, also the, the, the Asian theater, we can't hide, we can't avoid, and, and we, we fix it at the cost of enormous American blood and treasure. And I think if there's a common solution, the two of us are urging it's not to withdraw because we're going to have to do it anyhow. It's going to be a lot more deadly and expensive for everyone. Uh, there's a moment that I want to point to that illustrated this for me. There were so many surprises as I wrote the book and so many things I discovered I thought, like Eisenhower holding Patton back from liberating Prague, which in retrospect set the course of the Cold War. Uh, our, my German protagonist, General Toussaint, whose grandson Alexander is here, begged Patton to come to Prague. He wanted, he turned on the SS, he wanted Patton to liberate Prague, and Eisenhower blocked it for reasons you'll have to read about. 
in the book. And Eisenhower was a frust vexation to the Czechs in a number of ways. FDR, but another one of those moments, the book is peppered with them, another one of those moments comes at the height of the Munich crisis. And Czech President Benes described this as his most crushing moment, equal with the capitulation of uh, led by Chamberlain uh, to, uh, to Hitler's wicked, uh, crazy, sick desires. Um, and that was when FDR wrote the same letter in the, at the height of the Munich crisis. He wrote the same letter to Benesch, the victim, and Hitler, the aggressor who sought to devour the Czechs, urging them, why can't they get along? So uh, um, that's, that was a shameful abdication. FDR more than made up for it. But it was a shameful abdication of the moral leadership that Bob calls for. Um, well, that leads to one more question, and then I'm going to invite questions from the audience, by the way. And someone's going to go around with a microphone as I call on you. And, uh, and you can ask questions, formulate them a little briefer, that more briefly than the ambassador's answers. Do, but not, do not take me as your model in but, questioning. Uh, no, no, You'll be cut off. I'm joking. You're quite eloquent, and I appreciate it very much. Um, but uh, I, I guess I would like to know what is one thing you would have the United States do at this moment in which the liberal model, if you can call it that, faces competition, for starters, from China, where there are ever more technologically sophisticated methods of social control, where something like a million people have been sent to re-education camps in Uyghur areas, where it sounds increasingly like people who are outside of re-education camps are practically imprisoned in terms of being monitored all the time and all of their communication being trackable. And that's a competing model that is more and more wealthy uh, relative to the United States. What is one thing each of you would have the United States do? Well, we came up with a pretty good model on how to deal with uh, countries like that uh, during the Cold War, and it was, and it was twofold, really. Uh, one element of it was strategic, which was to deny uh, countries that are autocracies uh, military and strategic gains. That was what the containment of the Soviet Union was about. And I think it is vitally important that we do not allow China to use its increasing military power to uh, conquer Taiwan, to bully uh, Japan, to basically take over, not in an economic sense, but in a strategic sense, the entire East Asian region. That's the first part of it, but it's not the only part of it. And the other thing that uh, we did successfully during the Cold War was that we helped create a flourishing liberal order uh, that they were not yet part of, but which at a certain point they decided it was actually better to be part of than not to be. And that means in this case right now, reasserting our support for our democratic allies rather than criticizing them and looking to squeeze the last dollar in every trade deal with them. That was not the way we dealt with other country, our allies during the Cold War. Uh, and it was a very successful model. So what we need to do is re-energize the democratic community. Right now, I would say we are sucking energy from the democratic community by making it clear as a people that we're just not that interested anymore uh, even if we're going through the motions in some regard, we're just not that fundamentally interested in playing that, that role that we played for 70 years. Is it possible we are re-energizing the de democratic community in that here in the United States, if the world is a chessboard or if the country is a chessboard, it's like we've thrown the board in the air and we're waiting to see where all the pieces land, for better or for worse. Uh, we have a president who was essentially elected to do that. Is it possible that this is actually a re-energizing moment? I hear there are people who file lawsuits against the president of the United States uh, <laughs> who argue in different ways, who are gaining attention for their points of view. Uh, one, one of, I, I uh, another slight uh, divergence. Uh, you, might, you might have a bit more of a uh, skip in your step. Um, uh, 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 with my conclusion, uh, Bob is, I think, a little more, um, uh, perhaps a little less optimistic or feels it's, uh, what do you think, Bob? It's, uh, it's up for grabs. It could go either way. History would suggest that. I believe that democracy will triumph. I'm fundamentally optimistic. And the, the, um, 
he, he doesn't come right out and say it, but come, I was a little scared when I finished reading The Jungle Grows Back. I purposely chose... How could you be scared by a book that's black? As long as we're holding up books, I'm doing it again, Steve. As long yes, as we're are. holding up books, you'll hear from Bill Galston, who also has a very wonderful book, Anti-Pluralism, about these issues. Uh, my wife uh, was comparing, I took them both home to read this weekend, and she was comparing it to my book and my reflecting thickness? how much smarter my colleagues are in the, uh, <laughs> in every way. Um, so uh, I'm fundamentally uh, optimistic, and the pattern that I see over the past hundred years uh, is one of the, yes, democracy is over, since this Wilsonian conception uh, with France uh, of the new and Britain, uh, the UK of the new, um, the the new uh, transatlantic democracy model, the idealist uh, model. Um, since th this this was conceived and put into action, um, uh, 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 democracy has has had great surges. It has had its, its eclipses. It has had high and long noons, and it has short and long eclipses. Uh, the, the, the darkness uh, of democracy, uh, darkness at noon in the title of the famous book. But the dawn always comes. And this weekend I'll have a long essay in the New York Times Sunday Review arguing about the mechanisms of democracy that make democracy stronger, and the lack of those mechanisms, I have a slightly different uh, model uh, with much less reason for disagreeing with Bob or, or Bill about how it works, uh, and the absence of those mechanisms in our adversaries that invariably drag them down. In the, it may be, now I don't know how long this night of democracy, with this eclipse of democracy in the United States at the moment, a partial eclipse, I don't know how long it'll be, Steve. A lot will depend on the outcome I'm not arguing in a partisan way for this, only for everybody voting and voting for accountability. Uh, it will, a lot will depend on the outcome of the midterms. You said, you but said, I am optimistic. You said it's a long essay in the New York Times. <laughs> is that right? It, it okay. is. They had Let to me... put it in the Sunday Review because I'm too long-winded for the day. There we go. Day so, edition. Let me invite some questions from the audience. If you would just raise your hands, I'm just looking around right here, ma'am. In, in uh, yes, you right there. And uh, if you'll wait for the microphone to come to you. Why don't you say your name so we get to know yes, each other Yes, I'm a Marina bit. Fazl, an Afghan-American journalist. I would like your comments, please, about um, a diplom best course of diplomacy from the United States towards Afghanistan and Turkey uh, and the way that in the future um, relations among all sides can go a uh, positive direction with the rise of China. Um, also, is the experiment of democracy vis-a-vis uh, -vis our reactions as a human species towards globalism at a different stage of its iteration? Are we in need of a system of governance that is far more inclusive of all nation states that would serve the purpose of keeping us as cohesive and peaceful nations better than the form of democracy that's allocated to single nations, thank you. Thank you, there's several questions there. If you'll forgive me, I'm going to pick one and, and ask to, to our guests to focus on that because you raised the fascinating idea that the world has changed in ways that humans are not ready for. Uh, there has been no time in the history of the world where we've had such an instant and massive global conversation, for example. Technology is different than it used to be, although it's been evolving in this direction for a very long time. Is there something about this moment that is so disquieting because we as human beings have not evolved or adapted to it yet. I think that you know we have always looked for technological solutions to our political problems. And I remember a time not so long ago, maybe two decades ago or less, when globalization, the communications revolution, the internet were supposed to be the things that brought us all together, strengthened freedom, would pull, would undermine autocracy. And, and as with all past technologies, uh, the only element that screwed everything up was the human beings. And you know, all of these technologies can be used for good and for ill. 
And what we're seeing is that no technology is the magic bullet. And I would say it's not the magic bullet for freedom and it's not the magic bullet for tyranny. And this is sort of my point. It's not the inevitable victory of democracy or the inevitable demise of democracy. It's a struggle. It's always going to be a struggle because within human nature, there is a struggle between all kinds of competing needs and desires. So what we're seeing are not technologies yeah, I'm sure in some respect we're incapable of comprehending, especially when we start talking about artificial intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. But what I think we have to understand is that whatever the technology is, there's going to be a struggle to use it between these contending forces. Is the human struggle of the characters at the beginning of your book, early 20th century, the same as the human struggle we face today? I'm going to amaze you. Yes. <laughs> no, it's a joke. It's a joke. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your question. Let me take one from yes, this uh, this one right here. And is it green you're wearing? Yeah, yeah, green, green, whatever, green, blue, teal, whatever. Go ahead, say your name if you want. Hi, wearing. my name is Chiara. I'm Dutch and Italian, and I study at SAIS over there. And I'd like to direct my question to Robert Kagan. Um, you spoke about the American security guarantee as a sort of precondition for European democracy and liberalism. And my question is, now that I think many Europeans feel that this security guarantee is not something that we can necessarily rely on anymore, what should Europe do to protect its own liberalism and democracy? Thank you. Well, that's an excellent question, and I get asked that question a lot by Europeans, um, and particularly Germans, for whom this is the most fundamental issue. Um, I've sort of been struck by the way my argument has caught people's attention in Germany. Um, and the answer, obviously, is that within each country, uh, the forces of liberalism have to fight back against these uh, more sort of nationalist, tribalist forces, just as we have that uh, fight here. Um, unfortunately, again, I'm not, uh, I hate to be not the great optimist that, that Norm is, but the prospect that Europe is going to pull itself together as one great unit that is going to somehow uh, stand in for the United States as the global supporter of liberalism, I'm afraid I'm pessimistic that that's what's going to happen. I think what we see in Europe is increasing division and increasing uh, loss of faith in the European project, or what we used to call the European project, uh, and a Europe that is splintering and moving back toward uh, its past in some way, which does raise very serious questions for a country like Germany, because uh, you know, Germany, the German question has been the eternal question of Europe until it was set aside by this new security order. If that new security order is going away, we're going to return to the German question. And, um, you know, what can I say other than Europeans have to work to cooperate, they have to work to struggle for liberalism, et cetera, et cetera. But I just, I'd be very, I'm not confident that they can pull it together. Do you want to give a yes-no answer to this one also? <laughs> you can go longer also, Ambassador, please. Maybe. <laughs> uh, I, you know, uh, uh, if you look at the evidence only of, it's a deep question, and the question not only of what the Europeans mu must do, but what we in the United States can do. I just wrote a piece uh, on the in the Post on this when the pro-transatlantic democratic forces uh, are not in control uh, of the executive branch where foreign policy is principally directed, not exclusively, that's what I write about. Um, it, it seems to me if you look only at the events of recent weeks, we had a big scare in Sweden. Uh, there's some, uh, we muddled, the Swedes muddled through um, the EU, for the first time, has taken action against Orban. The polls may well veto, but it still is significant uh, that that has been done. And there's countervailing evidence. There's the disturbing riots uh, that have rampaged uh, through Germany, a debate about exactly what happened in those riots. Uh, but uh, democracy, uh, in one of the great uh, analysts of liberalism of the 20th century is Isaiah Berlin. And he talks a lot, his is a philosophy, I think, of how democracy muddles through. And uh, uh, I believe it's a longer argument, but I, I think the overall in Europe, Turkey 
Afghanistan and China present a harder problem, but the, the picture we see is of a Europe muddling through. I'll reflect on the area I know the very best, um, uh, uh, the, the Czech Republic and Slovakia, where I think democracy is under some pressure, but is uh, a, a vibrant still in the Czech Republic and in Slovakia when there were it seemed like they were going to take the country was going to take the next turn towards autocracy with the killing of investigative journalists. There were massive public uh, uprisings uh, which forced uh, Prime Minister Fico out of office, although he replaced himself with a crony. Uh, there's an independent president there, so uh, you know I I think there's going to be a a muddling until, to paraphrase Churchill, the new world once again comes to the rescue of the old, that could start to happen very soon. Because if the House of Representatives changes hands, I saw this a lot as ambassador, the power of the respect with which even a single member of Congress, even a minority member, is afforded in Europe. I think the House will become a node of new American support for transatlanticism. Uh, but the truth is, I, I do agree with Bob in this regard, we don't know. And it's up to us, everybody in this room, starting with those of you who vote here to vote uh, for accountability, irrespective of party, and for the Europeans and everybody to fight the fight. If we do that, I believe the evidence of my study is if we fight the fight with all we have, we will win. Is there a question from someone way in the back? Anybody way in the back? Wait, wait, wait. Oh, what did, if I can, I'm going to go to the back, though. Who's, whose hand is that up in the back? I can't, I only see a hand. I only see a hand here. Yes, the, with the watch on. Yes, waving your hand. Stand up. <laughs> That's fine. Yes. All I saw was a hand. Hopefully there's a body attached. You, yeah, there is. Uh, Mark, Mark Nadell. Uh, you, you mentioned the success, the, the, the well-noted successes we had in Germany and, uh, and Japan. Uh, contrast that with the failure so far in Iraq and Afghanistan of, of uh, bringing stable uh, democracy. Now, in one case, we had enormous confidence, and in the latter, in the other case, enormous incompetence. But, but one big difference is Germany and Japan were ethnically uh, homogeneous. Germany, after they destroyed their Jewish community, uh, Japan had had always been so. I mean, to, to to what extent are the are, are is a gain in the liberalism due to uh, you mentioned tribalism, but tribalism, uh, you know, eth ethnic conflict, we, which may be, you know, hardwired. So to, uh, we, to what extent is it that vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, uh, you know, economic insecurity and other factors that have been mentioned? Well, it, uh, I think it's wrong to look at both the success in Germany and Japan retrospectively as cakewalks, so to speak. Uh, it, they didn't feel that way at the time. Um, it, it, no one would have looked at uh, Germany in 1945 and say, boy, there's a democracy waiting to happen. Um, <laughs> and, uh, nor, nor would they have looked at Japan in that period. And so setting aside the complexities of Iraq or Afghanistan or any other, um, it, it's wrong to assume that, it was, that what we accomplished in Germany and Japan could only be accomplished in Germany and Japan. What is the difference? I hate to say the difference. One of the major differences, we went into Germany and we never left. We went into Japan, and we're still there today. Uh, we went into Korea, and we're still in Korea today, and South Korea is a, a flourishing democracy. Now, you know, that's not a great lesson because obviously we can't go every place in the world and stay, but more than just the staying, it's the ongoing commitment to dealing with problems that don't just vanish overnight, and that was certainly the case in Germany and Japan. So. Uh, it's a habit of American foreign policy because we're not an empire and we're not taking countries with the hope of ultimately either settling in them or owning them forever. Um, it, uh, Americans' desire is to get in and get out. And sometimes we're getting out in the middle of while we're getting in. Um, and that doesn't necessarily lead to uh, the best outcomes that we're looking for. Um, I, by the way, I, I sympathize with that impulse. In a way, it's a good impulse. We're not looking to expand our territory. We did that already uh, in the 19th century. Um, but it does make it harder to accomplish the kinds of things that we did uh, in Germany and Japan. Please join me in thanking our panel, our panelists. <laughs>
Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.